Hello, this is Mark Chatterton here with my Rock Files, and today I'm welcome, very big welcome to Del Bromham from Stray, who's going to talk a little bit about his life in music, and he's someone that has been there for over 50 years now, released many albums, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show, Dale. Hello, Mark. When you say over 50 years, that makes me feel really old. I know. Well, that's something we're, we're discussing in a minute, but... Um, well, that's all right. I was only about three or four years old when I started, so it yeah. makes me feel... <laughs> right, let's... Let's see, how, how are you keeping? Because obviously we're in um, January 2021 in the middle of lockdown in the UK. Yep. And it, you haven't obviously been able to do any gigs for a long time, but how's it been going anyway? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well. Uh, in the words of the old blues singer, I woke up this morning. So that was a result. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it was a shame because we were right in the, in the throes of the part two of the tour we were doing various shows with on our own and uh, with um, Ken Pusenick's Ground Dogs and of course with the Covid thing turned up it was into early March and um, everything we had for the rest of 2020 and into 2021 was cancelled which is very sad in, in as much as that after all these years the popularity seemed to be getting back again and um, a lot of the shows were really sort of full you know full houses so um it sort of it cut us off in our prime sir so yeah. um, so unfortunately um that had to stop i mean with all the best will in the world a lot of the shows were rescheduled but because it's gone on longer than people anticipated they some of them are reschedules again so literally week by week we're watching out to see what's going to happen to see when we can start again you know um in the meantime we started making a new stray album which will be the first one in about 10 years uh, as a studio album uh, but that's sort of in various stages of completion because like any album you do it as you go along and I think we've got about eight songs at the moment which uh, which we've got to I've got to meet up uh, again and um, and finish them off so yeah that that's kind of musically it at the moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah because I know you did do um a sort of small gig I think it was September in um Rain Rainers Lane in in North London um with uh your your uh musical um compatriot Simon Ronaldo um yeah and that was limited to 50 people all socially distanced etc yeah how, how did that go it was very good. Actually, it was Rains Park, which is Rains Park. In, sorry, uh, yeah, which is sort of uh, near Wimbledon Way and uh, West, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, I know Rainers Lane. I used to live near there years yeah. ago. <laughs> I got <laughs> it mixed so, up no, the, in my research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now the Rains Park one was was very good. Um, it was a different show in as much as um, uh, it, it, it sounds a bit corny, but they kind of build it as an evening with. And what I did was. I kind of expanded a little bit on what I've started to do in the last few years in as much as telling uh, over a story about the next song I was about to play or just generally chit chat, you know, as if like you and I, you know, except, yeah. except I've got the guitar, you know, um, <laughs> and um, it was Paul Newcomb who's uh, monstrous child is sort of representing me now. He, uh, he suggested the idea about doing it and also maybe including Simon Um because you know, in some songs, it's nice to have like the piano or or organ or something going along with the guitar, and um, no, it it went really well. I really enjoyed it, uh, but it was only the next, the day after, really, we kind of had concerns, shall we say, about doing any more because the problem being is that you, people with all the best will in the world. They, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say that they, they were pleased to see me. So I was pleased about that. But, you know, you, you have a couple of drinks and you actually forget and you start shaking hands or mm. people want to give you a cover or whatever. And what I should have really done for my own safety was gone straight up to the dressing room and locked myself in. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, it's just human nature. You know, I'm, I'm a very touchy feely person. I'm very, very much the same. So I do get it. But, you know, at the moment, you know, you have to be so careful and, uh, you know, I, I want to be playing again. So I want to make sure I'm, 
stay fit and healthy as long as I can, you know. Yeah. Have you um, thought about doing a lockdown session like a lot of people have done at all? I, uh, well, Simon and I did did one <clears throat> around the same time as as that, which um, which went out. Um, and we did that because we we did one before for for a little organisation, and to be honest, it it wasn't we weren't very happy with the sound of it, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, to be honest with you, I've not seen many that I was particularly impressed with, and I'm not always sure that it it it, it does anyone any any benefit from from doing it, you know. Um, but it's just my my opinion. Um, you never know. We, we, Simon and, and I had talked about doing another one and possibly if we could get the whole band doing it in some way, shape or form, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. So yeah. it's, a, long, it's a, a roundabout way of saying, yes, we have thought about <laughs> doing it. <laughs> but but not, we, haven't, we haven't got a date yet. No, no, sure. Yeah, because obviously a lot of um, venues who are trying to get going again are sort of advertising gigs from sort of April onwards, but it, it's so iffy at the moment whether those will actually happen, but yeah. maybe by the summer things might change. I don't know what you feel about that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is, as I say, it is a possibility. Fun, funnily enough, you mentioned that show at Rains Park uh, at the Cavern, which is a great little music venue. Um, <clears throat> I believe he had someone on air that, that, that did a live stream from there. And in a way that would probably feel quite more comfortable doing it that way, because I, you know, I, I feel better in front of an audience and just as if I'm in a rehearsal room, you know, yeah, sure. a, lot, a lot of what I do is kind of bouncing off of people, you know, if, if they heckle me, I'll heckle them back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's, let's move to the early days. Um, because you you were from Acton in West London, yep. and you started straight. I think you were only about sixteen at the time. Is that is that right? Actually, a bit we're a bit younger than that. A bit we younger, was, even yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was nineteen sixty six. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was at school. Uh, so if it's nineteen sixty six, I would have been fifteen in the yeah. November. So we would have been 14, 14 years old. Yeah. Uh, by the time we were 15, we were playing, you know, within, it just seemed to happen so quickly, actually. Within a few months, we were playing a lot of working men's clubs, which was quite funny, really, when you think about it, because none of us could go to the bar and buy a drink. <laughs> we, could, we, we couldn't even drive the van there. In fact, um, Richie Cole's uh, dad and brother and uncles had, um, had, a, had a, their own little coal and, company, coal and sons building company or coal and family building company. And... Uh, we used to borrow one of their uh, Dormerville vans, but once again, we couldn't drive it. And Richie Cole, the drummer, and Steve Gadd, the singer, they used to both have a Saturday job in a shop, a greengrocer's come butcher shop. So uh, they, there were two guys there, Stan and John, and uh, we used to get them to drive us to gigs because they, they were old enough to drive the van. But when you're 15 or 16, someone who's 21 seems quite old. Yeah. <laughs> Funnily enough. And, and, it, and, and then within a couple of years, um, we started playing more of the, the rock kind of clubs. And then even then, when you start playing, you know, I remember one of the first gigs we did was with Brian Auger. And we, we saw him playing, we thought, he must be really old. <laughs> but when I look back at things now, he was probably 26. <laughs> uh but so no it's, it's just funny you know the younger you are that that gauge that the age gap seems greater um i was having i was having a conversation actually only last week with my first manager ivan man and when i and he signed us up when we were like 16 17 years old and he would have been 21 at the time and he seemed quite old but as we've got as we've now got older we both feel about the same age yeah. <laughs> So what, what about your parents? Did they approve of you doing this or did they disapprove or did you get their support or whatever? My parents were really good, actually, and and very, very tolerant because I, I, I was brought up in a house of music. Uh, I had three older brothers. My next brother to me, Alan, he had a, his own band. I mean, right from the early days when I was really small, he had a, the skiffle group to start with. And then he got into like the 60s type of music. And I remember he had a guitarist, Brian Freeney, who was like Hank Marvin. You know, they used to do all shadow stuff and all the songs of the time. 
and uh, they used to like practice in my mum's front room and and if <laughs> I mean houses back then weren't built like they are now and um, we had like the the kitchen the living room and the little dining room and um they were rock solid and my brother's group used to practice in that room so um when it came to me forming my band oh mum dad can we practice in the front room in the little room we just got the little room yeah yeah so we we started practicing and it was really funny because the very first drummer we had when we was at school um steve crutchley um his mum was going out with a, a chap who was playing in a trad jazz band and uh, the trad jazz band offered, got offered a, a spot on Opportunity Knox with Huey Green. And uh, at which point the, their drummer left. So um, his mum persuaded him he should come and join the trad jazz band. So we were looking for a new drummer. And uh, Steve Gadd's um, friend who worked in the butcher shop, which was Richie, uh, was rehearsing in a little hall around the corner from me. So I went down there to uh, have a look and there he was playing and he was like then I've said it in before he's like the closest thing to Keith Moon I'd ever seen at the time he was <laughs> mad so I said yeah we got to have him in and this is the funny thing about rehearsing him in mum and dad's little room it was probably it was the first time in about 15 years that um, he started playing and my mum come in and said that drummer's there, we'll have to turn that down a bit. And it's the first <laughs> time, it's the first time we'd ever been told to turn down, and that was by my mum. <laughs> yeah, talking of Keith Moon, obviously all, all the Who were from Acton, did you ever cross paths with them at all? And not not really personally, no. I mean, once again, they were they were kind of older than us, but yeah. um, we knew we knew it, it gave us it gave us hope that someone from, from Acton, East Acton and Shepherds Bush could actually be doing all right. It was quite funny, actually, because we often used to see John Entwistle driving around and he had a he had a, a real passion for American cars. And uh, they used to live quite in the vicinity of Gunnersbury Park in Acton. And Pete Townsend's mum lived um, not far from there. And there's another funny story that some people know, some people don't. When they started making some money, Pete Townsend bought himself the house on Hill Pie Island. And... Um, he hadn't quite moved in yet, but um, he decided to buy himself a hydrofoil. And his mum and dad went out shopping, and when they came back, they found a hydrofoil parked in the front of their garden <laughs> in, in Acton, which <laughs> must have been quite a sight to behold. But um, <laughs> bless him, yeah, no. But so now we never really got to, to meet them very well, to be honest with you. You know, um, our other manager, Pete Amott, he was in a band called The Footprints and he got to know who because he's supported them with his band in the 60s a few times, you know. Yeah, yeah. So between 1966 and 1970, you were busy gigging. Was that just in London or did you go all around the country eventually before you got off, the record deal? No, I started off in London, but then um, with Pete and Ivan came along, um, we were all over the place. We were really really sort of uh, treading the balls everywhere. I, I call it doing our apprenticeship. Yeah, uh, learning, yeah. Learning how to do it. So, you know, unlike a lot of bands, we've been going, you know, even at that age, we've been going for about four years before we got our record deal. And we was like 18 years old when we got that first record deal with Transatlantic and the album came out in, early in, in 1970. Yeah, so when you got that first album out, which was just called Stray, um, yeah. Did you think you're right? We've made it now, and that that's it. Or did you have more ambition to go a little bit further than that? No, we we didn't take it for granted. We just thought it was an achievement to to have to have got it. You know, they weren't they weren't things that came around the corner very easily. You know, and um, we uh, w w <laughs> this this might sound a bit big headed, but the fact was, we we actually thought that it would take us probably a couple of albums to break it. Yeah, and um, we um, we could see other bands that we, we were getting on the same circuit as the people. If you look back on any archive melody makers and that, look in the back who's playing. Nearly every week there was Stray, uh, you know Uriah Heap, Genesis, Status Quo. All the bands are on the circuit. Th you know Thin Lizzy a little while after that. All the all the same bands, and it was we felt that all these bands were kind of getting a little bit bigger than us and we would we were sort of staying there we were, we were staying at the same level we kept going around 
Um, and actually, um, by the time we got to Saturday Morning Pictures, the third album, I, I honestly believe, and I'm sure the other guys did, I honestly believe that when we made that album, I was so pleased with it. And I just thought there was there was something, something in the air at the time. And I thought, this is the album that's going to break it. But it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that was the start of um, us thinking, oh, you know, we need a bigger management company, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because we could see all our peers going up the up the ladder and we were staying on exactly the same level. Yeah, because that was one question I was going to ask you that, you know, a lot of your contemporaries did did sort of make it and get to the, the sort of big yeah. time, if you like. What what reason or reasons do you think the reason why you didn't sort of quite get the, to the same level as they did? Well, what one reason for sure would have been the record label. Yeah, I mean, Transatlantic Records initially were um, initially and primarily a folk label. Yeah, and and I think they wanted to get on to the if you like a new wave of the prog scene, but by the time they got us, they didn't know what to do with us. Yeah, you know. Um, there was very little follow-up um, with regard to, you know, publicity, you know, getting radio shows. And, um, I mean, is it a perfect example of that? I mean, we actually first met Status Quo back um, around 1968. As I say, we were about 16 years old then. Uh, they were a couple of years older than us. And at the time, that was it was their second single was out after Matchstick Men called... Um, Black Veils of Melancholy. How about that for a memory? <laughs> uh, and that was out. And um, they were they were a really good pop pop band. You know, they, they were like a club band playing lots of covers as well as their own stuff. And by the time about 1971, 72 came, um, they stopped having the hits and they went from a, being a five-piece to a four-piece band at that time. And they wanted to get into um, a, a more, more rocky mode as... Everyone knows what status quo sounds like now, and, and this is this is fact. I'm not, I'm not making it up. Out Stray at the time was was so big on the scene. Any any promoter or manager knew that if they booked Stray, they would get a good crowd in. So consequently, um, status quo did one of their first shows with us at the Sundown in Edmonton. I think it was either Edmonton or Mile End, and. Um, we had kind of equal billing, but the difference was we were on Transatlantic Records. They were on Phonogram. And um, they um, they had loads of publicity going on. And we were thinking, why, why haven't we got this, you know? Mm. And after that, I mean, that was a perfect example of two bands going along at the same time. And then all of a sudden, Status Quo just, I think they their album got to about number five or six in the charts at the time. And and there was no stopping them after that, you know. Good good luck to them. That that was yeah. that that's what happened. Also, we didn't um, probably unfairly we didn't think our management was probably strong enough at the time. And uh, but in recent times, I, I discovered that they were in the process of us leaving them. They had organised or negotiated a contract with DRAM, who yeah. were quite a big label at the time. So you know, who knows? I mean. Unlike being in a band, life isn't a rehearsal, so we couldn't we couldn't stick our toe in the water and find out. We got offered uh, another management deal um, with uh, indirectly with worldwide artists, and they had people like Black Sabbath and the Groundhogs and Yes at the time. And I thought, well, they they must be they're doing all right, and you know they waved kind of a blank check at us, and we went for it. But you know, mm. maybe history would have been different, but we'll we'll never know. Yeah. So in the sort of early 70s, I think you brought out virtually an album every year. Um, yeah. After the first album, it was Suicide, then Saturday Morning Pictures, Manzad, Man, Mudanzas, yeah. Move yeah. It, Stand Up and Be Counted, Houdini, and then Hearts of Fire. So um, do you have a particular favourite album for, uh, out of all this this lot, really? Yeah, Saturday Morning Pictures is my favourite album. Yeah, yeah. Without a doubt, and and Houdini is my other favourite album for different reasons. There were two times in that sort of period, that 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 seventies period, where I personally felt very really happy with what was going on, and um, I just think we had the music right at those two particular times, you know. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think you know they've kind of stood the test of time, you know, musically. So I'm, I'm proud of them. You know, I'm proud of them. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, sort of come punk in 76, 77, would you say that was one of the nails in the coffin why you, you sort of ended, finished it off in, in the late 70s? Or? Well, once again, if I can draw a comparison with another band like Uriah Heap, for example, they had good management in Bron, you know, Jerry Bron and, yeah. and the bronze, bronze label. And we'd had quite a lot of problems with our management in the last couple of years. I mean, we were actually personally signed to Worldwide, to Wolf Pine at Worldwide Artists. And um, Pat Meehan, who was the, the boss of Worldwide, he sold it. He sold the company. Yeah. So it, it kind of left us out on a limb. Uh, Wolf was doing more work with um, uh, people in America. So we were getting left behind a little bit. And then... Um, we just really didn't have any management and uh, a lot of the agents weren't very keen on working with Stray anymore. You know, we, we through our management, we gained a bit of a reputation. Uh, and also not having the strong management. And here's the key. We needed a strong management who could take us to other territories where it was changing in the UK. Mm. Um, bands like Uri and those, they were they were staying more in Europe and also yeah. a lot of the Eastern European countries were opening up mm. and we should have done that. But we, we stayed put in England and it became tougher. Uh, it was very difficult to kind of manage ourselves because at the end of the day, no one wants to talk to the guitarist. Hmm. They want to talk to representation. As soon as, as soon as a, a, a venue picks the phone up, it's, Oh, hello. It's a, uh, it's still Bromby. The guitar is straight. They know you're on the back foot immediately. Yeah, I'm yeah. representation. I'll get them cheap, mm. you know, and uh, and we had to work to pay the wages, and yeah. um, so towards the end we were taking whatever we could get, and um, by the end of the seventies, I've just been writing my autobiography, Mark. Yeah. So I've, I've got I some of this fresh. I was got some of this fresh in my mind. It was yeah. uh, December the tenth, nineteen seventy seven, was our last show at that time. Uh, and we did, and that was at the Nottingham Boat Club. And we didn't know it was going to be the last show. No. Like Christmas, Christmas went, came and went, and then I just found loads of writs and summonses coming through my door, and we had to sell all our assets in order to, you know, keep keep the wharf away from the door. So it was it was a sad ending to a very happy story, you know. Yeah, yeah, because you did a solo after album after that, didn't you? I think it was quite. It was quite a while actually. No, it, was, it wasn't. Wasn't straight away then. No. No, no. It was, it was quite a while. I mean, we had various attempts of um, of doing get-togethers. I did. I did actually in 1979 uh, do a solo single. Yeah. On Gulp Records, and that's when I first met the engineer and producer Chris Tangarides. You know, he went on to work with lots of people. Yeah. And I had a. A kind of a, a solo band had various names that we ended up with the name Javelin, which was myself and Stuart Uren, who was in uh, Stray with me for some years, mm. and another drummer, Romek Parole, who plays with various people like Eric Bell and people like this, the Pirates. <clears throat> um, and uh, the guys in the band wanted to do some shows, but I was already committed to uh, my own thing, so they, they ended up getting a couple of guitarists in to replace me they played they played some shows for about a year or so uh, and then I went back with them again and we played in Spain and some other places and the boss at Gold Records who I'd had my single with said oh you you guys never did a, a live album did you so I said no so basically the live at the marquee album I think came out in 83 84 mm. uh, and that was a weird one for me because I ended up not singing yeah, uh, because in, in my absence, Pete had stopped playing guitar and he was doing all the vocals. So I was playing guitar. So it was it was an odd one to do. Uh, and then it faded out again. We didn't do anything. Then we had a reunion tour with Steve Gadd in about 1993, I think. Um, but at that time, and we, we, we were just one tour. But at that time, you know, it didn't really last. And Don McKay at Rhino uh, Agency the year or so after it said, you know, there's, if you're interested, there might be some life in it, but, you know, call it Del Bromham Stray and see what happens, you know, and I started all over again, you know, yeah. right, right, you know, started doing all the, all, the, all the little pubs and clubs again. I was back at that one in um, South End, 
that I did with the ground dog some years before. The grand. The grand, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I went I went back there again after about 20 years, you know. That was yeah. that was not so yeah, that was where I first saw you actually. Was it? I, well, there you go. I got very drunk that night. But... <laughs> And then you, ended up I ended up promoting you. Well, I'll, I'll drink to that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that they kind of brought it up to then, and since since the nineties, in various ways, shapes, or form. Yeah, I've been going on as, as a Del Bromham stray, and then um, <coughs> uh, I, the lineup changed again. Uh, we two thousand and three, we went off to around Europe with Iron Maiden. That was that was a good one. So I was, you know, I was beginning to think, which is ironic now, the age I am. But I was beginning to think back then, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm past my sell-by date because I was getting that impression from a lot of agents, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, been been around a bit. Yeah, probably past the sell-by date now. But we played with the, with Maiden on all those shows, and the Maiden audiences, you know, they love their band, but they yeah. made us really really welcome, and we went down really well. Um, I came came back from that. And John Bootle and Paul Watson, who were playing me at the time, they decided they want, didn't want to carry on anymore. So that was the point where I did my first solo album, The Devil's Highway. Yeah. Um, and then I did another one a couple of years after that, Nine Yards, and then White Feather a couple of years ago. So it's just I've been it's been on a roll, but I've just been keeping myself busy, having a go at different things, you know. Yeah. Blues yeah. albums and stuff. Yeah, because so I was going to ask you about about your solo albums. Obviously, they're a sort of complete well not opposite but a different than stray yeah. is that a sort of different side of you that comes out would you say yeah, well the first one the, the devil's highway was was kind of, kind of almost accidental i mean i i i'm unlike a lot of my peers i i, I was never really a blues artist and the, and the funny thing about it is that even with stray <laughs> In some of like the heavy rock circles, we were never really accepted because we were too bluesy, yeah. and in the blue circles, we were too rocky. So yeah. we, we never really fitted, and I never really fitted in any particular category, you know. And and unfortunately, in the last sort of 25, 30 years, I've noticed that musically, people want to put you in a in a category. Everything's got to be a genre. You've got to be either heavy metal or yeah. you know, blues soul, and I never really fitted into any of them. So it was suggested to me I do a blues album. And um, I thought, well, yeah, OK, I'll do it. But I'll, you know, in the words of Frank Sinatra saying, I'll do it my way. And uh, um, I picked a few old songs, which I was familiar with when I first started learning guitar. And as I say, I had lots of music in my house. And Big Bill Brunsey was one I remembered. And Lonnie Donegan uh, and, and the, the early Spencer Davis group. I loved them. So I picked a few covers and I wrote some new songs in the style of, because what I, I mean, it's, it's almost like doing a bit of research, but I, I, as a solo, going out solo, with just me and an acoustic guitar, I was getting booked into some of these uh, blues clubs or festivals, which had other bands on. And it just seemed that every, you know, all the songs there were, every band seemed to be playing the same songs. Mm. It's like, you see the first band come on, and then the second band, I thought, well, yeah, that, that, and they just played that. Or they were playing songs that all sounded the same. And I'm thinking, there's so many different types of blues. There's New Orleans blues, the Chicago blues, you know, uh, it's, it, there's so much of it. So on my album, I tried to vary it. Um, so I did that. It went OK. Um, Leslie West, around the same time, he came away from Mountain and he did a blues, a blues album. And he and I went out on tour that was around Europe in the UK um, and I came back uh, got an, another kind of version of Stray Together which was almost by accident uh, because um, I got asked to do a, a memorial show for Greg Ridley who died mm. and um, Dean Reese who's a keyboard player friend of mine um, he introduced me to Carl Randall and he said, oh, I've got this bass player. He might be interested in doing it. It turned out to be Stuart, who I've been playing with. Yeah. And I got offered a few shows uh, to promote my Devil's Highway album. So I said, oh, perhaps we could get together and play some of these tunes live. So I had a band out of that. 
Yeah. Uh, and then um, I think Dean stayed with me for a little while. We changed the name to Stray and played the Stray Tunes, which eventually, when Dean went off to, he started doing some acting. And then now he plays occasionally with the small fakers. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we ended up, Stray being a three piece with myself, Stuart, and Carl up until about just kind of up to two years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you've, you've gone from being a, a power trio to a five piece, obviously, with um, Simon Ronaldo and then Pete Dyer's back with you as well. So well, that, well, well, that's a story of Pete Dyer's life, Pete and my life. It was like an accident because yeah. <laughs> it, um, we played, funnily enough, not far from Rainer's Lane that you said about. That's uh, not, yeah. uh, in Ryslip. Uh, yeah. And at the time, Pete was living in Ryslip, and I was due to, well, I say we were due to play at the Tropic. And Pete um, called me up. He said, we, we were coming down to see you. He said, any chance I could get up and do a couple of songs with you? Because my daughter's never seen me play. So um, he got up and played, and uh, we had a lot of fun. And then every now and then he'd get up and, and play with us, you know. And in the end, we had a tour come up or something and um, I said, well, why don't you just strap that guitar on and come back and play? So it went from a three piece to a four piece. And then I got Simon in to do my Blues Devils thing. Yeah. Pete didn't play on that one. He, he stepped out of that one. But Simon came in to play the key stuff. <clears throat> and then once again, like the <laughs> how it all started off at the beginning, I thought, well, this sounds pretty good as well. We'll. And then there's the irony. Some blues clubs I went to, I had people shouting out stray songs. <laughs> you know, I could I, <laughs> I couldn't have uh, I couldn't have worked that one out. And I thought, oh, okay. Yeah. And I think it might have been one night or two, you know, because I had Stu and Carl with me. I said, play, let's play so and so. So, you know, and then we played rock gigs and I put the, the blues stuff in. And uh, I don't know. It, it it dumbfounds me. I'm not sure it's the people. I think it's the promoters. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. um, but uh, no, so after that, um, Simon kind of came in on every stray gig he could do and uh, and that. And, um, uh, and then Stu's decided he, he was going to pack it up and he was going to go and play in, um, uh, and he's going to live, sorry, in, in Spain. Yeah. So he went to Spain and uh, I, I knew somebody who I'd seen play, uh, Colin Kempster. Didn't know him really well, but I, I knew him. And uh, <clears throat> I went to see him play again with his own band. He had a, a three-piece band. And I thought, I just had a, a feeling about him. So um, we got together for a rehearsal and I gave him about half a dozen. I gave him about four songs to learn and he came down with about seven. <laughs> and uh, it was quite weird because um, we had a we had a rehearsal, and he played all these songs straight off without. And I and I looked around at everybody. I said, "Christ, we could have done a gig somewhere and not had a rehearsal." Yeah. So uh, yeah, so it's worked out worked out well, and it, it was sounding really good in the last you know b before it came to a halt in March. Yeah, because you mentioned earlier that you have been writing your memoirs, and hopefully that's going to be a book in the near future. And yeah. obviously you've got loads of different stories. I remember one you told me when you were supporting Rush and is about the brooms. Can you remember? A, Could, the broom you like story. to tell that to the people who are listening? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've written that. I'm going to write that. I've yeah. written that one. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> they, uh, we knew, we had, we had it in, in mind that last night of the tour, we were going to get custard pied. Um, just had, I just knew it was going to come and, um, it was the last the last gig and um i was standing on the side of the stage watching and richie cole was with me and i happened to notice there was a cupboard door open with a light on and i and i could i could see two brown overalls you know and um two brown overalls and some yard brooms i said here rich put one of these on I said, what, what? he said what are we doing i said let's go out and sweep up just as they're about to <laughs> that's the last song so uh, I've, we've come out Alex's side of the stage Richie is sweeping up behind Alex and I'm sweeping the broom 
right across in front of Neil Pert. And uh, uh, Geddy's just about to announce the first, you know, the last tune. And I went, wait, come on. Don't you know what time it is? People got homes to go to. Come on, and I've got the broom on screen. And he looked at me thinking, what? What? <laughs> and then, then he tweaked. It was me, you know. <laughs> that was, but sure enough, we, you know, no, that was right. It was the last night. They had custard pidus. That was why. Yeah. So I thought, sod you, I'm going to get my own back. <laughs> <laughs> Did he forgive the, you for that then? <laughs> no, that, well, we had, the, the, they were lovely, lovely guys, actually. And, yeah. Uh, we went back to the hotel afterwards. We got on so well with them. And uh, the Neil Pert story, which I've written, was really nice because the first show we did, um, we, we was in our dressing room. I think we'd had our sound check and there was a knock, knock, knock on the door and a little head poked around the corner and he said, oh, hi guys, uh, I'm Neil. I play drums with Rush. He went, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Ah, thank, I'm, I'm so glad you're on the tour. He said, I lived in Hammersmith for a little while. I used to come and see you at the marquee. <laughs> Just, you never know who's in the audience, yeah, do you? No, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah, I, we're sort of running out of time, I'm afraid. Yeah, but, sure, um, sure. It's been well, great. I talk, too much. I talk too much. You should know that. Yeah, yeah we could, we'll have to do another one sometime, I think, really, because we've got so many stories to tell, I'm, I'm sure. You yeah. can have a chilling in the meter. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one final question, because obviously... This year, uh, 2021, you've got a big birthday coming up later in this year. How dare you, sir? Yeah, I know. 21, <laughs> eh? Ho hopefully, we'll see you playing live again by then. Um, uh, are you looking forward to it, or are you sort of not so keen on it? Does it, does it matter to you? No, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I mean, um, it, uh, particularly as the band is sounding so good now, and also we've got some new, new songs in the can, which I want people to hear. Um, but uh, no, it, it's funny, you know. I have got a mirror, you know. I know what I look like. <laughs> the actual the, the frame um, might look different, but I still feel about twenty in my head. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, that's that can be the paradox at times, you know. By the same token, I've, I've said to my other half Annie, I said to her, if ever you think I look ridiculous, tell me, and I won't play anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what? I, <laughs> but no, I'm looking forward to it. And, and and funny thing is about playing. Uh, and another one of your um, your associates, Mr. Dave Ling, who's a well-known journalist. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I did an interview with him some while ago, and after the interview, it was a telephone interview. And after the interview had finished, he said to me, "Del," um, he said, "I hope you don't mind me saying." He said, uh, "He said you're 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 in rather in, you're you're in rather good condition for a gentleman <laughs> of your years." And I said, oh, thank you very much. So yeah. He said, no, he said, uh, you are. He said, oh, I've seen bands younger than you don't leap around as much as you do. He said, have you ever thought of retiring or anything? And I said, no. I said, you can quote me now. I said, I'll be the BB King of Buckinghamshire, as it was. <laughs> yeah. And BB was 94, I think, when he passed away. So yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not going anywhere yet. Yeah, so there's life in the old dog yet then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not going anywhere, mate. No. So you, you, well, that's you, nice you to know. Not, yeah, you can book another session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank thank you very much, Del, for that. And just to remind people, if they want to find out more about Stray and about you, um, there's a website which is called stray-the-band.co.uk, Stray the Band. So if you look yeah. that up, you'll be able to find out the information of when Stray are going to be touring and playing again. But yeah, thank you I mean, all. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you forget the link or whatever if you just google stray and put stray the band in it'll bring up the right one because there's various other strays and stray cats and all sorts of yeah things. yeah sure yeah but thanks ever so much Del, for doing that and it much appreciated and um yeah. wish anytime mate. hopefully we'll see you again very soon so oh, thank you, you won't see the last of me yeah okay I'm, I'm i'm more contagious than that bloody virus <laughs> yeah right that's the final word okay thank thanks Del. bye right. now take care all right.